Welcome back. Our next guest has written a, an amazing book for middle schoolers of all ages. And those could be some of us, or it could be the young people in our lives. And as we move into the season of gift giving and looking for interesting things that could be appropriate for the young people in our lives, I think this book is really gonna grab you. So Dr. Patty Michelle, I'll just give you a little bit of her history and then let her tell the rest of it. But she literally has done what so many of us would love to do is take all of our expertise and all of our personal passions and roll them up into a ball and go out and do everything that we could possibly do. So she's done it. And so in addition to being a public health specialist, she is a mom and author um, and she combines her passion for technology and innovation and, of course, science, women's rights and pulls it all together to inspire kids and really address the hardest challenges of our time. And some of those are the environment and pandemic preparedness and responsibility around AI and technology. I mean, these are not small topics, folks. This is, this is the real deal. So instead of me going on, I'm going to introduce you to Patty Michelle. Patty, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. This is such a, like an incredible opportunity. It's really fun. And we love to, again, spotlight people, cool people doing cool stuff. That's literally where this show focuses. And when it comes to someone like you, who has taken not, not only your expertise, but your passions and really you know, figured out a way to bring it to so many others, not just those you see at work every day. So tell us, where did this come from? Sure. So right uh, as the pandemic was starting, I was at the Society of Children Book Writer and Illustrators Conference in New York City, um, where incidentally, I think I got COVID. And so <laughs> this is in February of 2022, of 2020, sorry. And, um, and so while I was at that conference, I was pitching a young adult novel at the time. And, and you know, the, the agents that I was pitching to basically like encouraged me to keep writing, but they said that I should focus on a different topic because the topic oh. I was focused on was gun violence. So they were, so talk about big topics. I was, I wanted to tackle gun violence and they weren't as enthusiastic about my, um, my topic as, as, <laughs> as, 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 as I was. So uh, instead, uh, what, what ended up happening during the conference is that there was a lot of discussion around the gap in smart science, themed or science inspired fiction for middle graders. And, and so I took a bit of a step back and was like, oh, I have, I have one of those at home. So I, I, at the time, my son Gabriel was seven years old. So I have an inbuilt audience and I love science. I, you know, I was the head of my science club in high school and, uh, and geek out on technology and, you know, and everything related to science. And, and so then I, I, you know, was kind of, you know, watching as the pandemic was getting started and joking, you know, tongue in cheek with, with my son that things would be very different if children were in charge uh, and we wouldn't be in the situation we were in. And so, so then we just started throwing around ideas, which then turned into the antidotes pollution solution. And, uh, and rather than him being an inbuilt audience for me, he had very strong opinions about the characters, about the story, and and really fun ideas to make it, you know, light and relatable to um, to kids his age. And so uh, and so we just started, you know, mapping out the story, and uh, and then would talk about it on, on long walks with our pandemic Westie, Mr. Mahfouz, named after the Egyptian uh, Nobel Prize winning writer. <laughs> well, nothing like passing on the heavy duty to your son, right? 
I think that's amazing. And first of all, just asking kids for their opinions, you would often be shocked at how many they do have and how many of them are are really, to your point, if kids ran the world, um, it wouldn't be a terrible thing. But now you've got this group of fifth graders, the antidotes, and they're all, they all feel to me like a little bit of different parts of your son and and different aspects of each uh, each character could definitely build up into one full person. But I love how they then have to come together to solve a really difficult problem. I mean, so the pollution, you know, you wouldn't you would say that smart minds have attempted uh, to actually resolve this. And in fact, it is probably the children and their future and they will figure it out. But talk about the antidotes and how you came up with the actual problem that they have to solve. Sure. So I wanted to focus on a public health issue that uh, was realistic as well as imminent and which is which is scary. So I think, you know, as 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 much as it was scary to go through the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which is a once in a lifetime sort of pandemic for many of us. Um, I wanted to create a public health issue that that could in fact happen and and may be happening in many right. in many ways already. And so I was looking for public health issues that spanned animal and human health and, uh, and had a bit of an environmental component to it. And in my first rendition of the antidotes, uh, w- the original title was actually disease stoppers. And my <laughs> Egyptian father was like, no, like no more <laughs> disease talk. You cannot name this book disease stoppers. <laughs> so we wanted something more positive and so came out with, with the antidotes. Um, but in my first in my first iteration of the the disease uh, that that would then impact you know fish and and kids, I had the most complex disease transmission pathway and and I was workshopping the book with a middle grade fiction writer and she read it and was like, "You gotta cool down on the science <laughs> and and you know." Uh, drum it up on the the story and the characters and 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 all of that and so i worked with a very dear friend and colleague uh who is an animal health specialist and and she and i worked together to come out with a disease pathway that was much simpler much easier to understand and and could help illustrate some of the public health issues that I was interested in in helping to illustrate, including things like basic clean water, uh, mm-hmm. which was the first you know, major public health uh, issue globally with the cholera outbreak in the UK and the work of Jon Snow, which tied it all to one you know, infected water pump that was spreading uh, cholera to a local part of, of London. And so uh, so to me, I really wanted to kind of find something that would help kind of teach some basic public health and and science like principles. And then we were able to wrap around that some experiments that kids could do uh, at home with their parents um, or at school with their science teachers. Well, I have to say the simplification of a of a difficult and and really um intense topic is probably the best way for all of us to learn. It's not just for the middle schoolers, but literally we can all learn much more about the real issues if we can simplify it so that it makes for easier conversation. And it includes everyone because at that point it becomes family dinner conversation. And that's just a I think a great way to be able to address some of the more difficult conversations. Um, and you, of course, have have drawn from you know years and years of work across, I think, over 40 countries 
um, in science and combining with technology. But for the purposes of, of the book, you're also very involved in the STEM community. So share a little bit of that with us. Sure. So one of the things that uh, that we see quite often is that girls uh, especially don't see themselves in the sciences and the technology, you know, and 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 math. And and a lot of women who are scientists themselves don't self-identify as scientists, which I think is really is quite funny. I mean, I didn't for a very long time, and I've been a scientist my entire life. And what did you call yourself? Hmm. What did you call yourself? How did you I call myself a public health specialist? I was I was somebody who worked in in public health, and, and oftentimes I wouldn't even use the word specialist because I I didn't want to draw too much attention to myself, oh. and so you know so I just would tell people I work in public health and I would go about doing my thing. And uh, but what we found is that you know, as a result of that, there aren't a lot of very visible role models for for young girls in uh in the sciences and uh and so i wanted to to use the book as well to to have a conversation around some of those issues where where we've seen in even as grown-ups right in 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 the in the work world that you know for you know, boys and girls, they, they approach things very, very differently. And so uh, when you're looking at diversity and inclusion in the sciences and in technology, engineering, et cetera, uh, we need to start to unpack some of these issues. And, and, I, and I do a lot of this work in my work in digital health overseas with around things like um, gender and you know, really trying to address things like the gender digital divide, which, you know, women are 20% less likely to have access to a mobile phone than their male, you know, their male counterparts. And so when you're trying to design technology programs, you know, for, you know, pregnant women, you have to address the, the reality that, you know, many of them won't have access to a mobile phone many of them will not know how to read. And so you can't do things that are text-based. And many of them will not have been involved in the design of those technologies that are meant to help improve their lives. Um, and, and you don't have as many female programmers, et cetera. And so, so one of the themes that I sort of take on in this, uh, in this book is really to illustrate what it looks like when you have uh, diverse teams of kids working to address a complicated issue, um, public health crisis. A complicated issue and something that they actually share. So they do, they are forced to come together and the way that they go about it, as you point out, the, the whole approach um, really makes for an interesting dynamic and I think helps adults as well understand both the, a level of communication with children, but a level of communication with each other. So I really think you've you've done an awful lot in one small book. You've <laughs> really attacked a complicated, important problem that we know in fact exists and you know, we, don't, we don't need to look farther than our drinking water, but certainly the conversation about the oceans and what's happening today with pollution and dumping these kids, the antidotes could very well come up with a solution that could help us on a much, much more grand scale. So what's next for the antidotes? Do you see them continuing down the road and solving other problems together? Well, absolutely. We are hard at work on book number two in the series. The working title is Masters of Technology. And so uh, one of the characters uh, who is the, the techie in, in book one uh, creates a, an algorithm, submits it to a coding contest. Uh, the algorithm goes rogue and oh. kind of gets taken up and starts exposing um, secret information that, that the, the antidotes have. And so they have to learn how to become critical thinkers and users 
of technology. And, and so they, they have to come together again and work together again uh, to design the technology solution, but then also uh, actively engage with technology even without a solution um, because frankly, the, you know, the regulations aren't protecting our kids the way that they should be protecting our kids. And, and somebody has to, you know, start working with kids so that they understand what they're being exposed to and what's happening to them subconsciously, uh, through, through technology. Um, and so we've seen huge bumps in anxiety and depression among, um, especially among adolescent girls, um, but also among boys and online bullying and, and shaming and, and all sorts of behavior. And, and I think, you know, as kids are developing and, uh, and growing, they need to be equipped and they need to equip each other and they need to kind of come up with solutions that are kind of their own solutions to these issues that feel kind of right for them and, uh, and are easy to, uh, to apply and, um, and mobilize others to apply. Well, I think what you're doing is amazing. I have a fifth grade niece at home and I can totally see the antidotes becoming her new best friends. And in terms of critical thinking, I think we, at this point, we all need to be able to take a step back and look at things um, with a broader scope and a broader view because we weren't all born this way. And I think what you're bringing is really opening a thought process for a lot of us who may not have seen it that way before. So thank you. And how can people find the book and how can people find out more about you? Great. So the, the book is available through IndieBound and independent bookstores. Uh, it's also available on Amazon uh, as a paperback and Kindle. And, uh, and you can follow me and the antidotes uh, at uh, patriciamichelle.com. You can sign up for our newsletter and, uh, and we send out sort of regular um, updates on what's happening with the antidotes, but also uh, I include uh, a moment of STEM and, and some other things um, that parents can use to start conversations around uh, science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, and the arts with their kids uh, to make it fun. Excellent. Patty, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for sharing. And I know our viewers are going to be very interested in meeting and learning more about the antidotes. So we look forward to that. And we will see you again. We'll be right back.